right down. Could use the warm up. Done that better myself. You want to get in under my block, find the weak point. Just like that. You're getting it. Quick on your feet now. You want to create distance. Yes. in order? Know enough not to punch yourself in the face or get shot for pulling out a gun too early? Brilliant. I'm working out how we find Zero Day and ruin their day, but I need someone with actual legs to do the legwork. Hope you're ready. We have some damage control to do if we want to change the perception that we're a bunch of violent thugs. I'll let you be the judge of how best to handle yourself, but remember, you represent DedSec now. I don't know if you've heard anything about the crew having doubts. I might have. Well, we took care of our ship. We know this is working. We're all in. Excellent. I feel the same way. We're just getting started. Dead set can't be destroyed. So where should we start? Make no mistake, London is under occupation. Armed mercenaries patrol our streets, allegedly to keep people safe, but really they're keeping the people scared. It's how Albion keeps control of the population. Intimidation and spectacle. So, we have to ignite the will to resist in the people of London by showing them that Albion aren't the solution. They're the problem. For that, we'll need information. I'm pushing two sets of coordinates to your optic. Cheers, Bagley. I've identified two opportunities. One, we're going to disrupt some Albion propaganda. Remind the people it's not Albion's way or the highway. Two, we need intel about Albion operations if we want to throw a spanner in their plans. You game? Just leave it to me, Sabine. Brilliant. Let's get the people of London on board.
Building a resistance group requires operatives with specialized skills. Technical abilities, firearms handling, and physical training are all valuable. Bare knuckle boxing rings are a good place to find people who are good at throwing punches or taking them. By defeating each opponent in an arena, you'll have an opportunity to face its best fighter. Prove your physical superiority and they may consider joining DedSec. I'm guessing that's some sort of primate society thing. This is the bug, the show that holds up a mirror to the world and smashes itself on the head with it in despair. I'm Andy, joining me, as always, uh, Alice, and... Uh, I deny everything. <laughs> just a good state of existence. Some good news, at last. There are no medicine shortages, according to the government. None at all. There have been various allegations about that. It turns out they are all fake news, trademark. But there are none. There are no shortages of medicine. Don't take it from me. I'm not a medical supply expert. <laughs> take it from our beloved government. It's fine. In fact, I'm going to read between the lines here and actually say there, there's probably there's, there's too much medicine, if anything. Just medicines, medicine. You can't move for medicine. In fact, just this morning, I tried to pour some cornflakes into a bowl for breakfast and out tumbled a 12-month course of immunosuppressants, corticosteroids, and antiretrofungal neurodilatory estrogen spermatotropic fruit pastels. The people claiming there are medical shortages are probably high on lots of medicine that they've been... <laughs> <laughs> I, for one, believe that there are no medical shortages, Andy. Just last week, I went in with a broken arm, and they suggested it might just be extreme period pain. They prescribed me a drink of water and an astrology chart. <laughs> I th I'm, we, we can't be too far away from them just prescribing stiff upper lip like they did at the Blitz. <laughs> My uncle had a leg removed due to diabetes. They halved his insulin because they said there was less of him to be diabetic. <laughs> So, anyway, people, don't believe what you read or hear about there not being enough medical drugs to go around. It's not true. It's hospital hogwash. It's pharmaceutical flim-flam. It's medical mendacity. It's <laughs> hypocratic humbug. It's nonsensical, narcotic, nincompoop. I think I've made the point. Do not believe the news telling you that we've run out of medicine, nor should you believe the empty shelves at the chemists. They're also lying. Do not believe your doctor saying, sorry, we're fresh out of that. You're going to have to eat a carrot and pretend. <laughs> and do not believe your own cobweb-ridden medicine cabinet at home. It might look empty, but it's not, for it contains the only medicine any of us truly need stirring music please producer chris freedom the medicine of british freedom the analgesic knowledge that however ill you may be bloom are keeping an eye on things for you i'm investing heavily in the placebo effect right now you're listening to the bar obviously i don't entirely mean that because what is the first rule of the third millennium if someone in power tells you something is fake news what is it Correct. A 110% cast iron, tungsten coated, granite centered, cosmically immutable, scientifically unarguable fact. But surely, Alice, the more important question for all these medicine freaks whinging on about feeling a bit poorly or having a fatal but curable illness and slowly dying unnecessarily is this. Do we actually need medicine? If you today got diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness, would you not look around at the nation that we've become and think, hey doc, put your life-saving treatment down, I'm going to take this free one-way bus out of here. Now hold that pillow over my face until the twitching stops. <laughs> I just don't think we should think of it uh, in such a negative way. Don't think of it as a medicine diet, Andy. Think of it as a series of healthy lifestyle swaps. Swap out anti-inflammatories for antacids. Swap out the iron lung for the aluminium lung. Swap out MRI machines for Mary machines, which is just a lady called Mary telling you you're fine. <laughs> 
Obviously, critical shortages are as much part of our daily lives, our society and our culture today as things like uh, football, music and complaining about the weather used to be in the old days. And uh, well, food shortages, yeah, that's, we just learn to live with them, don't we? And there's a lot of positives as well with all these food shortages. I mean, we were eating too much anyway. <laughs> as a nation, the government's just helping us live healthier lifestyles. It's so hard to diet on your own, isn't it? You need the support of a friend <laughs> or a loved one or a government or collapsing social infrastructure. Positive two, meat, very bad for the environment. So we're actually rebuilding the polar ice caps every time we eat a scrap of lettuce. Uh, three, positive three, the human race had already cooked all the recipes it needed. There was no, nothing more to be done with food. We've, uh, you know, we've, we've done that. We can tick it off. We've done it. Uh, I was bored of food anyway. I've been eating it all my life. If you've been doing the same thing three times a day, four sometimes, seven or even eight times a day, you're bound to get bored of it. <laughs> and uh, also... Final positive, no more meal times. Freeze up all that extra time for appreciating all the selfless hard work that Albion do to keep us all safe here in Britain. Well, as you say, Andy, people are drawn to novelty and everyone's had breakfast once. <laughs> Why you got to keep having it again and no, again? Boring, repetitive. There's enough of that in life as it is. You are listening to The Blood. Well, another story that, uh, that has uh, come to the fore uh, recently is that all European imports have been banned for public health reasons. Uh, which is great news. I mean, at least we can get ill eating good, home-produced, locally sourced, British, industrially unsafe food. That's uh, something we can all uh, cling to. Public health reasons, those are curious words. <laughs> Alice, I don't know that in case the public gets too healthy eating all that Mediterranean muck. <laughs> Let's have British food for British tummies. Spelt, nettles, rabbit. That's all we need. <laughs> That's all we need in the glory days. Everyone round to Nigel's for dinner. Yum, yum. Who needs Italian olives when you can eat pickled rubber bands in a soup of regret? <laughs> Who needs a nice cheese when you can eat a lukewarm, unspecified rat meat pie with zero spices? <laughs> Sand, nettles and bits of dead fox. That's all we needed to eat in the glory days. Let's make Britain great again. That's all from the bug today. Good night, sleep tight and make sure the bed bugs do bite. voice of objection for a most objectionable world. Hello, Bugsters. Welcome to The Bug, the comedy show that holds up the Medusa of satire to the already immovably concrete face of modern Britain. I'm Andy, I bench 480, and I can crack a tree in half just by looking at it. Can I? Well, what is reality anymore, anyway? Alice, what do you bench? Bench body weights. Well, not my body weight. Okay. Body weight of a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to give that kind of detail. Just very impressive. Weight. People look yeah. at me and go, where did you get that baby? You are listening to The Blood. In this week's Truth News, according to an official poll, 98% of Londoners are very happy with CTOS. And I am not sure that I agree with this, Andy. I don't think 98% of Londoners have ever in the history of London ever agreed on anything. <laughs> you, could, you could not get 98% of Londoners to agree that oxygen was better than breathing a fog of raw liquid feces. And they expect us to believe that everyone agrees CTOS is better than not choking on shit mist. <laughs> Uh, maybe they just meant 98% of, of one specific Londoner <laughs> who bought shares in Bloom before its tentacles grew into every crevice of the country. I mean, this is this is not just any old poll, we should say that. This is not any any poll. This is an official poll, right from the very heart of government. It's not a knock-off fake poll of an elderly couple and their mangy old dog sitting on a bench waiting to die. This is an official poll. So let's just put those words, official poll, through an online translator in case you didn't study languages. Let's find out what it actually means. Made up lie. There we go. <laughs> Got to clear that up. I, I don't, I think it's fair to say, entirely trust these official polls they feed us, Alice. I mean, they could publish an official poll saying that over 99.9% .9 of children like ice cream, and I would instantly assume that all children now hate all ice cream and would prefer to eat a bucket of gravel mixed with dead badger. <laughs> they could publish an official poll saying that 10 out of 10 cats prefer cat food to being whacked with a tennis racket, and I would assume that all cats have gone vegan and were queuing up outside Wimbledon meowing, choose me, choose me. <laughs> I trust these polls as much as I trust someone recommending a movie that they watched during a breakup. <laughs> <laughs> Your judgment is impaired, Sally. <laughs> I'll make my own decisions. I trust those polls as much as I would trust Mary Kelly if she came up to me and said, congratulations, Andy, you've just won a free holiday to the south of France in the back of this windowless van. <laughs> I think official polls are like the unsolicited dick pics that the government provides us. I didn't ask for it. I don't believe it. It's on an angle. You've artificially inflated it ahead of time. And anyone that falls for one deserves all the disappointment of trying to match it to reality. <laughs> 
These polls are absolute rubbish, Andy. I read one the other day that said the plumbing in London was good, and it absolutely is not. I mean, what? We have this technology now where they can spy on my every bowel movement. There's a, a CTOS camera installed inside my underwear drawer. A media drone is scaring the birds off my garden bird feeder, and you can't get me consistently hot water. Uh, speaking of uh, media drones, I mean, they're everywhere, clearly. The great thing, I guess, about media drones is that, as inanimate robots, they actually have more humanity, compassion, and dignity than the human journalists we used to have to put up with and a, and a much more accurately calibrated moral compass. But it's the intrusion I can't stand, Alice. I'm in showbiz. Look at, look at me here in this windowless dungeon. I'm in showbiz. And it's terrible for me, the, all these drones, knowing I'm being filmed all the time, every day I have to make sure I've done my hair and makeup and not wearing clothes I've ever worn before. But we all have crosses to bear. <laughs> At this point, they've installed so many CTOS cameras, I'm not sure where they'll put the new ones. On top of the old ones, just cameras watching other cameras like a social media influencer so self-absorbed they don't know how to sleep without turning it into monetized content. <laughs> I think that's the logical end of all society, isn't it? Where just everything has just become a camera filming another camera. To be honest, I've just given up on all news and reality now, Alice. I, just, uh, <laughs> I, I now just make up my own headlines these days. I get a piece of paper and a pen. Remember them? Paper and pens, those were the days. And I'll just write down the headlines I want to read. Now, I'll just make my own newspaper. Look, here's, here I've got today. If you point at the bird shit on your car window and say it's a currency, no one can tell you otherwise. <laughs> Screams <laughs> Chancellor at Bilderberg, karaoke night. Uh, let's, write, let's write another headline. Here we go. PM announces Britain back on track after swapping all Crown Estate properties for some magic beans. <laughs> Might as well. We've got to do something as, a, as the nation we are today. Here's another one. Wild joy on the streets as Britain signs 864 zillion pound trade deal with Bolivia. <laughs> there we go. Build a better world. Uh, government claims only nice people will benefit from agreement to sell trampolines, mermaids and warships to landlocked South American nation. We're building a better Britain. Here's another one. Environment probably fine, claims drowning scientist. Invent the world you want to have, people. It's going to be way, way better than the one you've actually got. From the bug, goodbye. Resistance fans, you're listening to the Bug Podcast, the objective voice of objection for this most objectionable world. I am Andy, not my real name, so good luck finding me, Monsieur Bloom. My real name is, in fact, Andrew, uh, and I live in, note this down, a deluded pseudo-reality of my own making, which is, in fact, <laughs> the most densely populated place on Earth these days. Overcrowded, some might say. Joining me, as always, my next-door neighbour in these Netherlands of nonsense, it's Alice. Yes, indeed, it is Alice. Alice, who the bleep is Alice? I am not going to tell you that. But <laughs> you, you can just sort of sense it from the timbre of my voice. <laughs> uh, let's spin the wheel and find out where we're getting today's news from. It's coming, it's coming from here. I must get a new wheel with at least one other place on it. And the headline <laughs> today, Alice, our borders are safe. We can all sleep easy in our well-bordered beds. 4,000 illegals were deported last month. These illegal people breaking the law just by existing. And, of course, illegality is contagious. It can osmose through your skin just by standing next to an illegal person. So uh, we've got rid of 4,000 of them. My question for you, Alice, is why only 4,000? Is that really enough? I will not feel safe until at least another 75 million people have been deported from this country. And I'm here in Britain on my own. <laughs> As a bleeding heart lefty, Andy, I would normally be outraged about this. But really, I think mass deportation is a very handy way to break 
break up with a partner. I'm sorry, baby, I love you, but an anonymous source has reported you for snoring really loudly in a French way. <laughs> So, everyone out. No exceptions, Alice, not even you. It's for the good of the country. Everyone out. Unless you can prove that your family are in the background on the Bayer Tapestry cheering on King Harold at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. Get out. Actually, that's not British enough. Unless you can show, unarguably, that your direct bloodline is untainted by anything since before the Romans. Uh, actually, scratch that. Unless your direct ancestor was personally responsible for building Stonehenge, get out of my country. I guess when you look at it, you know, the best ways to stop immigration, apart from, uh, obviously, the uh, end of the world, to make the place you want to stop people coming to as unpleasant as possible. Well, we absolutely are doing that, Andy. Well, you know, fair play to the government for, for, for helping us with that. Uh, <laughs> another option, extend the White Cliffs of Dover. They've been resting on their laurels for too long. Very inefficient, it turns out, as a means of stopping immigration. We need to extend them by about another 11,000 miles, the full wrap around Great Britain, and they could do with be, being about a kilometre and a half higher as well, with a special greasy coating to stop people clambering over the top or however they get in. Uh, here's a quick joke for you, Alice, about immigration. <laughs> Did you hear the one about the woman who went to into the immigration processing center and was ever seen again? <laughs> no, Andy, I didn't hear that one. Boom. Set up. Punchline. <laughs> Classic. For those of you uh, unfamiliar with it, the Immigration Processing Centre is, of course, where so many of our, our guests to Britain uh, go for a longer-than-desirable game of involuntary hide-and-seek. You are listening to The Blood. I will conclude by saying, out of all the things wrong with Britain today, I think immigration is right up there, Alice. When you think of all the health professionals we've stolen from overseas over the years here in Britain, it's quite possible that all these people are just coming here to try to get an appointment with their local doctor. Yes, Andy, certainly as someone who came from the expanded arm of the empire when Britain was still reaching out rather than folding in on itself, most of us just come here to visit our stuff in the museums. <laughs> the British way. Uh, speaking of international movement, Britain has recalled all European ambassadors after a spy scandal. Uh, I think this is probably a good thing, because British foreign politicians are always putting their foot in their mouths. How much worse can they do if they're not there? <laughs> I mean, by definition, the fact that there's a spy scandal means that they were terrible spies. <laughs> the point of spies is that there's never a spy scandal. <laughs> Yeah, but let's give credit to all the spies that haven't been in scandals and therefore might as well not exist. <laughs> well, they've arrested those German spies in that SERS crackdown on the illegals in Hackney, and I think that's I think that's a sad thing. I think I, I used to think of Germans as quite scary, but that was because I'd been watching World War II movies where the Germans all have English accents. They speak in that very, like, precise way. It's very, you know, we have ways of making you talk. And now Germans all have that American accent where it's all like, oh, welcome to the party, we're having a really nice time. <laughs> They're much friendlier Germans. Let them stay. Well, that's all today. Bugsters, remember, it's not as bad as it seems. Uh, honestly. <laughs> uh, I hope. Until next time, <laughs> bye-bye. on Buccaneer, your source for what they don't want you to know. This time we're turning our focus back on the media to look at my former employer, the GBB. As we know, the broadcaster has been through a lot of changes since the Hassani government gave in to pressure from his corporate backers and privatized the corporation. Today, the GBB is a shadow of its former self. It's become a tool used by the government to circulate fake news and misinformation. So how did we get here? Where did it all go wrong? How can we tell when our national media has become state propaganda? Our experts speak on conditions of anonymity for their own safety. Here's disinformation and media expert Charles, who's seen free broadcasters built up by journalists and torn down by demagogues all over the world. So before the media fragmented, there was this voice of authority that was trusted and you and and worthy of trust then what we ended up with is a really commercial model where whether you're talking about an app on a smart device or whether you're talking about a broadcaster the most important thing was to keep you in that environment for the longest amount of time possible uh, and because that meant money in their pocket and in order to do that a couple of 
of things happened. Mm. One was the use of manipulative techniques around behavioral economics, things that would just keep you scrolling or keep you listening or keep you looking for more information. The second is that that kind of environment favors sensationalism. And so you got more sensational headlines and more sensational stories, and it didn't matter whether they were true or not. It just kept people in, and it kept them in the loop. So we ended up in a situation where nobody trusted anything, and nobody believed anything at all. And that is the perfect environment for an authoritarian voice to come in and say, no, wait, we are the truth. So the ground for this environment really got created when we had uh, suddenly authoritarian politicians everywhere, and anything that threatened them or they disagreed with, they would call it disinformation. That's disinformation. That's fake news. And again, we got in a situation where nobody really believed anything. And the trouble is, is if you were telling the truth, it's very hard to get your message to cut through all of the noise of all of the disinformation that's there. So like, you know, you remember out on the edges, there was this story about when they would take a house by force, they would take any infants and they would crucify them. And that's a great, fantastic, viral story. And how do you counter that story with the truth? The only way you can counter it is by saying, no, they didn't. And of course, no one wants to spread that story. No one wants to hear that story. They want to hear the sensationalism. They want to hear how people were victims of violence when in fact they weren't, or they were victims of insurgent forces when in fact they weren't. <laughs> The news isn't neutral, it's a battleground. Here's media researcher and academic Alfie. The media has, of course, been perhaps the key way in which governments have controlled and influenced their populations. So you know, totalitarian countries have typically used huge mainstream media outlets to sell one kind of news, one kind of biased news to its population. Of course, the media has always played this kind of key role in, in methods of state control. Um, I think what's happening now is perhaps even more concerning where uh, you previously been pre-crisis is Britain, we had perhaps more diverse voices in the media, but now with the GBB, uh, you're really only seeing one brand of, of news and therefore only getting one truth. So people end up with a, a very biased and controlled idea of the reality and, and the world that we're actually living in. There was of course many concerns and many problems but in a way there were some positive things that like not all information was coming from one place and and so you'd, you'd have kind of far-right media outlets developing and then left-wing media outlets developing to combat those and, and kind of challenge the the mainstream newspapers TV stations radios and make sure people were, were questioning the, the, the validity and, and truth of the information they were receiving so whilst there was the digital afforded more more fake information it also made makes us suspicious and skeptical of information and makes us question the information we're getting. And I think in pre-crisis Britain, it might not have seemed great at the time, but there was something positive about that, that there was a lot of distrust in the media and, uh, and, and in the different kinds of truths that were being told. Whereas now, I think you're seeing a, a return to a more, a more traditional and older pre-digital sense, actually, of people just trusting what they're told. And, and that's why we, we, have to, uh, we have to be here with radio stations like this to challenge those concerns. Most citizens feel pretty hopeless, I think, and, and unable to, to fight back against these kind of huge mainstream corporations that simply entrench and support the, the ideals and ideologies of the state. It can, it can seem very hopeless indeed, but I think, you know, the fact that you're, you're out there listening, we're in here talking, shows that there is still a space to combat these false truths and disinformation that's being sold to us, and, and that there's, it's never possible, really, to completely shut down. Um, despite all the technologies that they have at their disposal and all the financial and corporate power and all the, the physical power, it's never quite possible to shut down people's uh, desire to get to the truth and, and fight for their own ideologies and values. And, and you know, we're, we're out here starting that task, so don't give up hope. You've been listening to Buccaneer with me, Tash. We'll be back soon with more of what you'll never hear on the GBB. Keep listening, keep sharing, and keep resisting.
welcome back to The Upload. Today, we're talking about cryptocurrency. Crypto now seems like it's been around forever, but it's really quite a new invention. Were you an early adopter? I was one of the first that was in this market. There seemed to be a new way of financial transactions, a new way of money. It's something that we could completely reinvent and change some of the legacy financial systems around the world and really give power back to the people. Yeah, it was a real shift in the way that the world works. Let's recap the basics. Central to cryptocurrency is the distributed ledger technology, the tech that keeps track of all transactions. And what this means is you can have a decentralized system without having to trust any one party, like old-fashioned banks. One of the reasons why I got involved so early was that you could stay anonymous. Yeah, the features of cryptocurrency very much fit into that early mindset. It was all about finding an alternative to centralized systems. It was kind of a countercultural punk ethos. The whole point of the distributed ledger is you're not trusting any one person to keep a track of who has what money or how they're spending it. It's all out there in the open for anyone to see, and yet you can remain secretive. But not everybody now wants to keep up this crypto legacy. They don't share this attitude anymore. We've seen institutions, businesses, even governments experimenting with crypto, which doesn't really fit into its original radical counterculture mold. Yeah, it's kind of weird today to think of people not using cryptocurrency. It's so mainstream now. You know, I'm almost nostalgic for the feel of cash. Good old-fashioned paper and coins. First they changed the paper notes to plastic notes, and now it's just all digital. There's nothing to hold on to. It was great just to be able to have a little bit of money to carry around with you. I think the turning point in the UK really came a few years ago when the pound dropped 10% over just one season. People living off grid started using crypto, and just as everyone was losing faith in the pound, they were gaining it in cryptocurrency, which turned out to be much more stable. Kind of the opposite to what people thought in the beginning. And then, of course, there was the recession. It didn't take long for startups to see an opportunity in this new way of doing finance. A lot of traditional money was converted to crypto, and it really shook up the financial sector. Can you remember when they first introduced crypto cash points? That was really sneaky. It was a classic startup behavior. They just installed them everywhere. No consultation with the government, no approval or anything. But people immediately started to use them. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of how Bloom put out the optic. They just made it free and flooded the streets with these devices. Suddenly, everyone had them. If there's this great option of tech, people are just going to start using it, no matter the cost. Parliament actually tried to put a stop to the cash points, but people were using them so much already. There was outrage. I mean, some parts of London were already using crypto as their primary currency by then. And now, apparently, or at least in theory, crypto is illegal. Yeah, in May this year, economists found that crypto was being traded more than the pound and banks were not happy. They basically forced the government to ban cryptocurrency in a last-ditch effort to save the pound. But it's not like that's worked. People are still using crypto, and it's been pushed further, deeper underground. Things used to work fine with crypto, and it was just a peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy-style system. Now it's all on the dark web and wrapped up again in organized crime. Yeah, if you want to make something thrive on the black market, just make it illegal. Nausea, vomiting, and headaches. Now you're listening to The Bug, the resistance comedy show brought to you by the Buccaneer Network. I'm Andy, joining me, as always, uh, Alice. I'm uh, excited to be here. Apparently, the resistance is uh, not going well. Uh, again? <laughs> well, there has been some news about DedSec, the resistance and or terrorist organization. Delete according to preference. Not preference, sorry. Delete according to whether or not you work for the government, SIRS, Bloom, the Kellys, or Albion. <laughs> according to a SIRS official... DedSec is no longer a threat, uh, which I guess is true in that it was never a threat in the first place. Reminds me of when my great aunt Gladys had her appendix out. Oh, Andy, that surgeon's a real threat, waggling that knife at me, trying to knock me out. Well, they're called a scalpel and an anaesthetic, Gladys. <laughs> anyway, if SIRS officials say DedSec is dead and buried, I guess we have to assume that uh, DedSec has never been stronger. But I do worry, Alice. I mean, sometimes I think... Is there any hope? Do you, do you still have hope? I don't think I'm allowed to have hope. We're living in this self-selected algorithmic... 
nibbling away on the rotting carcass of a once free Britain. Yum, yum. yum. Hello, Bugs. This is a bug. I'm Andy. This is Alison. Today, we're going to be pretending that everything is fine. Yeah, and back. Yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? That was as long as I could manage. That's my second and a half. A reality time now, however. And, uh, well, finally, today, we're going to road test the latest update to the CSA app, the government app that has brought the great British tradition of snitching on people you don't like back to the very heart of public life, the uh, school playground. I'm going to tell a new threat that has got a whole new lease of life these days, thanks to uh, CSA. And isn't Britain all the more fun because of it? No more grumbling about your neighbours playing their music too loud. Just simply report them to the state and have them, shall we say, involuntarily rehoused at Hotel Cass, the uh, chain of hotels that was formerly known as the prison service. What was the slogan, is it? If you see something, say something, or if you think you might at some point see something, say something, or if you haven't seen anything but don't like someone, say something anyway. Uh, so, well, let's have a look at this new app, Alice. I'm sure you've got it on, on, on your phone. I mean, at, at first glance, well, the interface is lovely. It's so neatly designed, a simple button to snitch on someone. That's so much better than non-government in former apps like Stool Easy, Can Can Canary, or Narc Shark. I mean, look, I just need to geocache where the person I'm ratting on currently is. Let's call her for the sake of argument, Alice. Uh, sorry, uh, Andy, I was busy reporting you to the authorities what, for rolling I... your eyes when passing a Nigel Cass propaganda poster. C could you not let me report you first, please? <laughs> Let's have some decorum about this. Um, I'll just take a quick little photo so they can get a drone to pick you out of a crowd at your next riot or trip to the shops or <laughs> walk, walk in the woods. Uh, and you, you can input input your accusations uh, with the app. Well, let's go old school. Let's let's call the phone line. Uh, let's call the phone line. Here's the number, uh, listeners, in case you want to dob someone in, as long as it's not me. Uh, 0044-203-807-3832. And don't forget to get the permission of the person who pays your bills before you call that number. You have reached the voicemail of the Signals Intelligence Response Service. At the tone... Please leave the name and the address of the person you would like to report, and officers authorised for lethal force will respond. If you are reporting a loved one, please...